This is MongoDB for the relational DBA. So, so what is Mongo, okay? So Mongo was the original Linux product. Um, you know, majority of the users are running it on Linux. Uh, but it's well supported on Windows. Um, they have several, they have, uh, so they have a former Microsoft employee, they have uh, plenty of people who are .NET programmers working on the .NET driver. Um, actually, they have two really good C++ uh, developers working on the core server on Windows. Um, you had people like me in the early days that kind of, well, you had people that ported to Windows before I came along, and then people like me who made it suck a little less in Windows. It works fine on Windows. It, just like MySQL or Postgres, you know, even though the primary Linux product works fine on Windows. Uh, it's open source under the AGPL license, um, and the drivers are under the Apache license. Um, so basically, the way, and to get, I guess your question was, how does 10 Gen, is it an open source project, how does the commercial company uh, do it? So they own the copyright. Um, if they want to accept any, so if you want your source, if you want your patch to go into the, their version of MongoDB, they make you sign a document signing over copyright over to them. So everything I do, contribute to them, they have the copyright for. Uh, but I can go on and make a fork of it, but it's just like I was forking an open source project I don't have the copyright to. You know, it's under the GPL license, I can go on and do my thing. Um, but you know, if you want the official support, um, you know, you go to Tangent. Now that's not stop. That's not stopping me from starting my own company, saying I'll support MongoDB and give me money. It's just I didn't write the whole thing, and you want to go to Tangent that has the full body of experts. Um, you know, and MongoDB is not a relational database. It's not like MySQL or, My, or SQL Server or Oracle or anything. Uh, so we'll get into what that means. And the internal storage mechanism is BSON, which is kind of like binary JSON, binary serialized object notation. We'll talk about that a little bit. And it's developed by TenGen. Like I said, they own the copyrights. Okay? So, so a little more about BSON. Um, BSON is, like I said, binary serialized object notation. It's exactly what it sounds like. It, if you do any web development, you know what JSON is. Um, it, it's just that in binary form. If you want to, uh, it is strongly typed. If you want to see the spec, you can go to that website. Uh, that website is actually a GitHub repo. If you want to change the actual, uh, you know, if you want to propose a change to how uh, Mongo stores this internal data format, you can literally fork that project, um, and they'll probably reject a change to the spec itself unless you're just adding a new data type. Um, but you can go there and read about the internals. Um, you know, not you know a lot. It's not like a lot of internals are undocumented. It's not like you know with DBCC they're undocumented commands. They're you know like Paul Randall knows how to do stuff with a hex editor that. You know, other people don't know because they never worked for Microsoft. Um, it's completely open source, and anyone can look at the source code and figure out how to do anything. You know, um, so so how do we store data? I mean, not in the BSON spec, but how do we store data in MongoDB in, in terms of you know what? How is data organized? Okay, so just like SQL Server on a database on a server, you have like SQL Server.exe running the service. Well, you have MongoD.exe uh, on Windows as a service. And then you have one or more databases, just like in your, you know, you have one or more databases in your server. And each database has one or more collections. Collections are a little bit like tables, uh, but things, things start to fall apart or get different. Um, a collection has one or more documents, which are kind of like records. But records are flat, and tables are well-defined things that contain flat rows. A document is a little different, because a document is key value, a document is just a series of arbitrary key value pairs. Keys are strings, the values can be null or scalar, which means an int or a string or a date or what have you, which we know. Or it can be another document. You can have documents inside of a document, which is why if anyone ever heard, you know, no SQL, you don't have to do joins. This is how we do it. We just have, imagine just having a table inside, you know, having a, another row inside a field inside your relational database, almost like an XML, almost like X XML columns in, in SQL Server. Um, or it can be an array. So you can have an array of multiple scalar values or multiple sub-documents in one, in one, uh, field in, in one document, okay? But, but what does that look like? So, so this, is, this is how, if I were visualizing one record in, in SQL Server, right, it would just be like, you know, here's the name, and here's the address, and here's whatever, and then there, you know, it'd be two columns, right? But here we kind of have a more 3D looking thing, okay? So we have underscore ID, which we'll talk about what that is later, but we have my name, scalar value. Email, I have two email addresses, right? A relational database, you'd have You'd have a, you know, you'd have a, a table of email address, and you'd have foreign keys. Um, here, you just literally store two strings inside your database as an array. It's not that it's stored as one string with a comma. It's just literally stored as two strings. There's no, you know, dirty hack of you have to know that there's a comma there or something. 
And then I have a subdoc in my resume, right? With my languages, another array of all the languages I know, and then my experience, which is null. Okay, so you can start null. I'm supposed to laugh at that. Basically, so in MongoDB, there is no schema, right? So I can have one document that looks like this, and I can have another document that looks completely different. I can have, in the same collection, I can have another document that uh, is, you know, about my uh, model of some car, which had like make model year built or whatever, right? Obviously, you want to have the, you, you want to enforce the schema in your application level or something, so you, you'd want them all to look the same. But uh, under, generally speaking, every document has an underscore ID which had this object ID thing, which I'll talk to. So if you wanted to do a lookup and you happen to know either, you, you would just have to know in your application that everyone had the name or everyone had an ID, and you could say, let's say I, you knew what my object ID was, yeah, there was a way to do a find. Just like you do a select where ID equals a GUID, you can do select where the ID equal that object ID. Did that answer your question? So if I have your name, Justin Deering, you can say, I could say, give me email for Justin Deering by yeah. searching that document. Yes, that, yes. That collection. That, yes. The document or the collection? The collection, okay, so the database, it's database and then collection, which is like a table, and then document is the record. Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, so what else do I need to know? Uh, so there's a global write log. This is, this is one of the things that kind of scares people off. So every time you, you write something to MongoDB, or up until version 2.2, which just, okay, so I should give version. So Mongo right now at 2.2, which came out, um, August 28-ish, um, and then before that was 2.0, so basically it was 2.0, 2 was the dev branch, 2.2 two the current branch. If you want the bleeding edge, 2.3 will be out soon, that like bleeding edge, and then 2.4. So the uh, even number of the, the stable versions. So 2.2 just came out and it fixed this uh, global write lock issue a little bit. And basically what that meant, every time you insert one record into the database, into one database somewhere, it locked that entire database. Every collection of the database got locked. Now these inserts were usually really fast, right? Because um, and because you don't because generally you don't have transactions in MongoDB. Um, so it wasn't a you know so it did lock the database, but but things you know um, inserts were really fast, so it really wasn't that much of a problem usually. Um, in two two there is some con concurrency, so there is collection level there is some collection level concurrency. So most of your inserts now. Uh, we'll have collection level concurrency. There will soon be like a document level concurrency. And actually when they wrote the code to get uh, it up to collection level concurrency, they said they fixed like 80% of what they need to do to get record level concurrency. They just wanted to wait and they wanted to be very conservative and they just, they didn't want to release something that wasn't fully baked. So, um, so anyway, so that's something that, that's one of the bad, that's one of the things people think are bad, but in the end, you you don't really care about your concurrency, you care about how fast your insert is. You know, you don't, you know, you care about how fast your insert is and does your insert really lock someone else, right? Like in SQL Server, in the end, you don't care about deadlocks until, you know, the user calls you up and then you have to go look in, you know, the spit tables and say, where are my locks or run SP who is active by uh, Aaron or whatever, uh, Adam Cat, right? Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind, okay? Another, Weird thing that probably might blow your mind in the TDA. Cursors are good. Stored, proce stored procedures or stored JavaScript is bad. So um, we think in relational databases, a cursor is something to be avoided, right? Because a, because relational database is all about doing, um, you know, tuples calculus about doing set based algebra, and cursors are just about ignoring that, right? And just doing everything in a loop manually. Um, but every time you run a query in MongoDB, you get a cursor back. The cursor is not, the cursor is your result set, okay? So your cursor is actually, um, if you ever do programming on the application level, which most of you gather applications, it's more like a DB reader, okay? For, it's a read-only thing, and it, it's what you get after you're done with your query. So you will see some of the documentation, you know, everything, everything returns a cursor. Every driver returns a cursor when you run the shell. You return a cursor with a bunch of records, okay? So a cursor is a good thing, okay? It's not something that you should avoid. Uh, the other thing, so there is, so MongoDB, the shell doesn't use SQL. It uses JavaScript. It uses JavaScript just like your web browser. It actually uses the Chrome, it actually embed the uh, Chrome SpiderMonkey JavaScript engine in there, which is really fast um, for doing queries in the shell. However, now if you want to do a stored procedure, just like, you know, how many how many of you people are of the school of thought when you write an application for a database, you know, the only thing, the, the, all the, your .NET code or PHP code or whatever has to call a stored procedure only, that there's no ad hoc SQL in your thing. 
How many people were in that school of thought? Okay. How many people were in the ORM school of thought? No one wants to raise their hand in a DBA group, right? <laughs> but I don't know what yeah. the ORM is. That what you said? ORM, yeah. Object relational Actual relational map, map. Uh, like uh, entity framework. Okay, like entity framework or in hibernate or whatever. Okay, but or just just doing ad hoc SQL. They do it at the end of the post to call it stored procedure. So I was at the stored procedure school of thought. First time I wrote a Mongo application, and so I wrote CRUD I wrote CRUD code for this app, which is still running in production. Nothing ever broke. However, um, remember that global write lock? Well, in stored JavaScript, it gets worse. It blocks the entire server when you run. Your 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 uh, stored JavaScript. Of course, all my stored JavaScript. I was writing a very simple app. Were just one line queries, so everything was really fast. But uh, stored JavaScript is something you you want to avoid because um, because uh, JavaScript is kind of running at a higher level than T SQL. So the planner can't sit there and ask, so so the planner can't sit there and look in your JavaScript and figure out what to lock. Basically, so if you want to draw an analogy, it can't. So it just locks everything. While that JavaScript running. Now, that being said, if you want to do and if you want to do uh, ETL, if you have a job running at night on an application no one's looking at, yes, you can use stored you can use stored JavaScript to do a bunch of number crunching. You know, there's MapReduce, which is using stored JavaScript. So um, it's not entirely just like a cursor is not. You know, sometimes a cursor is the way to go in in T SQL for the particular job at hand for particular reasons. Sometimes stored JavaScript is the way to go. By the way, with, uh, Bizarro, does anyone know if the Superman, he's like the anti-Superman guy, if anyone got that. Any questions? Uh, another thing, so 32-bit SERP, so everyone knows SQL Server, right? You're, you, can only, um, you can only have uh, two gig of memory in SQL Server on a 32-bit system, unless you have the, the WOW whatever, and unless you have the SysWOW 64, and then it's like three gigs or what have you, so you should run on a 64-bit OS, you should run um, you know, 64-bit version of SQL Server, so you can access all your RAM. Um, so you can actually store on a 32-bit system in Mongo. So Mongo does something really cool called a memory map file. Basically, everything. If you and the cool thing about it is, if all, if you have more data, if you have more RAM than you have data stored in your MongoDB running on your server, um, it will store everything in RAM basically once once you like run it run once everything's first loaded into RAM, it'll stay in RAM and things get really fast. If you have uh, more data than RAM, it degrades very nicely and you know it, it degrades nicely and it only figures out I'm going to store my indexes first or whatever is hot will get stored. But it's a very simple memory module where you it this there's no way like in SQL Server to say I can I only want to use so many gigs of RAM. There's no way to do that, right? But because of the way that uh, that simplicity um, Everything, every, all your data is actually mapped to an address location. So, and because of overhead, you can only store about 2.5 gigs of data, or on Windows, even less than two gigs of data on a 32-bit server. Uh, so, you want to run a 64-bit OS. Um, this is becoming less of a problem now. It used to be a, a bigger issue. Um, so, just another thing to keep in mind. Do you mean you can only cache 2.5 gigs? No, you can only have 2.5 gigs at all. Okay. Yeah, because of the because of the simple. Memory map files as opposed to like you know because it's just using a memory. It literally, do you know how a memory map file works in operating systems? So yeah, it literally like takes all your data and puts it in one big memory map file. Which so a mem basically what a memory map file is, uh, every OS can do this, Windows, Linux, what have you. Um, but let's say you had a, a five byte file, and uh, what you do is you'd say okay, I have five five bytes on disk, and then I'm going to uh, allocate five bytes of RAM, and I'm going to do a one to one mapping. And every time I read, I'm going to read from memory. Every time I write, I'll write to memory, and it'll the cache will write to disk. But it's just a one-to-one -one mapping, and there's no, there's no, uh, yeah. So, and if the if you you know if you have 500 gigabytes of, of whatever, it's going to still make a memory address. It's just going to write it out. It's going to allocate that to swap. But it's just a really it's very simple but very effective, um, and it works really well with your your paging algorithms on a modern OS. Um, so just, just ask a question along the line of the memory then. Yeah. <laughs> if, so if I have you know, the RAM, I have three gigs of RAM, let's say, and that's two and a half gigs. Let's just say I had two and a half gigs of RAM, and that loads up first. That's going to take up all my RAM on that machine. Yeah. And if no other applications are running, just. No, no, no. So, so, okay. So if you have. Um, no, but if, if what you're going to do is that two and a half gig, it's going to allocate that to two and a half disks of RAM plus swap. 
Okay, plus but yeah, so if you have other stuff running with Mongo, it will degrade very nicely. So if you have like yeah, so if you, so let's say you have sixty. Let's say you let's say you have an Amazon Cloud instance with the uh, sixty three or sixty four gig to RAM. I forgot what the max is, um, but you happen to have a hundred gigabyte or you have a full terabyte of data. And let's say you just do. Let's say you restart your server and you do, uh, you know, you do a find all on this big ass collection. Um, it will sit there and allocate all that to swap, but it'll it'll degrade nicely. But you know, and it'll sit, and if you have like a web server running taking a gig, it'll give a gig of RAM to you know it, it'll 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 play nice, but it'll try to eat all the RAM it can. Um, and you know it'll. Okay. Another thing, um, journaling is optional but recommended. So in SQL Server, you have this journal thing. In your NTFS, you have a journal. MongoDB journaling was added late, and they just, uh, in the 64-bit OS, in Q2, it's default. But just always make sure your journal is turned on, just in case you lose power or you kill your Mongo instance not nicely. Uh, it'll just write stuff to a, it, you know, it writes stuff to a journal before it writes stuff to the main database thing. It's like a log in the database? Yeah, log, yeah, just like. Uh, yeah, like the transaction log, yeah, or we have, well, more like the LDF than the transaction log. That is the transaction log. The TRN is the transaction. Well, the TRN, oh, you're doing transaction. You do what you want, but you want. Okay, yeah, okay. I guess I'm, I'm not a real DBA. <laughs> you found me um, I always run in simple recovery mode. Okay. Another thing is don't run a single instance in production, which is something TenGen uh, will always recommend and everyone will always recommend. So SQL Server, watching 2012, I think clustering comes in standard now, right? No? no I was just thinking just had always on. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, anyway, so one thing uh, with Mongo is Mongo supports, uh, it supports replica sets, uh, basically, which is it's, it's a form of master-slave replication where the all the instances decide who's going to be the master, and you just kind of write to the cluster, and it it, it keeps everything in, in line. So you can add and you can add more pairs to the set. But basically, uh, they built replication, which is high availability, into MongoDB by default. And as a result, they always recommend uh, to always have at least two servers. If you have a really really small instance of MongoDB, um, then just run two MongoDB instances on the same you know production server and just have them just for redundancy. The other cool thing, when you want to back things up, it's really simple, just stop one of your servers and just copy, you know, you can even copy the file instead of running, there's the Mongo dump command, we'll talk about backing up a little more. But it makes backup really simple because you just take out one of your replica sets. But uh, generally speaking, it's recommended never to let, always let a, never let a single instance run in production. I think the way the licensing model is, they probably won't even support you on production if, if you have a single instance. And another thing is, and this is more of a configuration annoyance than anything else. Uh, so when you do an insert in MongoDB by default with any of the drivers, it's fire and forget, which means you do an insert and it might fail and you'll never get an error message. Um, on every driver, you just have to make sure. So it's one of the things that the DBA, we have to tell the stupid developer, nice, I'm a developer, I can say that, um, is make sure that you turn on safe write where it'll return the error message and it'll throw an exception and, and you'll know if something went wrong. And, Make sure you try catch, but most developers don't ever try catch. Um, at least in my experience, when I have to inherit other people's code. Um, so yeah. So why would you ever want to fire? So so the question, of course, you're asked: Why would you ever ever want to do a fire and forget? Does anyone can anyone think of a reason why you want to do? It's really fast. Okay. And here's where here's like one of the few edge cases you want to do fire and forget. Right. Let's say you're doing day trading, right, and you're destroying the economy. Um, so let's say you're, you're a day trader, right? So what do you do? You you want to, uh, so you, what do you do? You get a quant to come up with some crazy algorithm. He writes some algorithm in R or something, and then, then you have to you know kind of write that into something productionable so you can make some system where you can actually do your day trading, right? So you want to, when you're doing day trading, you want to get as much data as you can, right? But if you lose, you know, if, if you lose like the price of a stock at a particular point, Unless you lose a lot of it from a particular, like, you know, unless you lose, like, everything for a whole five-second window, statistically, it's insignificant to your whatever your algorithm you're building, okay? <coughs> so when you do fire and forget, you might be able to, you know, insert, um, you know, ten times as many inserts than if you were doing your safety check anyway. So in that particular case, when you're doing, like, your day trading or, or any other kind of thing when you want to get your data fast, you can. Maybe you're doing... Uh, Scientific or you know scientific instrumentation where you have some instrument that can collect data really really fast and you know you're not going to collect all of it anyway. 
you will turn on fire and forget and do your inserts as fast as you can into your database. And then later you're going to do your analysis of, you know, and then you'll do your analysis of via whatever algorithm you do to do your day trading or cure cancer or whatever, hope you're curing cancer. Um, so yeah, so, so that, that's another um, consideration. And I mean, I, I think this was kind of, honestly, I feel it was a mistake to make fire and forget the default option. Uh, in the Mongo shell itself, which we'll show, which is uh, you know how you run as administrator, that's not fire and forget um, by default. That is that will give you the error because um, that's meant to be administrative, obviously. Um, another thing is the shell is JavaScript. So in a SQL Server, the shell is TSQL, right? So the shell, you either have SQL Manager Studio or you have the command line SQL command. You know, uh, TSQL is is as uh, you know, low level as you go, unless you want to write raw TDS packets to the network. Um, but the difference here is, so the big problem with SQL is, you know, there's, if when you're writing SQL in an application, um, you know, you have the injection attack problem if, if you don't use AD, if you don't use AD.NET parameters, you don't set up entity framework or, or you use uh, dynamic SQL or, or what have you, right? Um, so one thing they solved here, in all the drivers, you never, uh, you never pass inline JavaScript to the drivers. All the drivers queries, uh, so in .NET, you're literally passing key value pair to the BSON document, which is basically a hash table. And it looks just like a hash table in .NET. Uh, you can do it with the .NET 3, like the hash table syntax. You're not passing strings. Uh, you have to go out of your way to like just pass an inline string and do inline JavaScript in any of the drivers. Um, so that prevents you, so there's no injection attack in MongoDB, um, you know, unless you're, you have to go out of your way to do that. Um, what do you pass? Oh, what do you pass? So you're passing objects. So you're making, so all the drivers have special like objects. Um, or you know, like in PHP, they're arrays. Or you're a .NET guy? Yeah. Okay, so there, you have what's called a BSON document type, which inherits from iDocument. So it, just like you can, so you can use that, uh, uh, you can like statically define a. Uh, I got it. As soon as you say you pass objects. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. You can also pass POTO that actually has a POTO serializer. So, um, so drivers. Um, so I guess most of us are in a .NET shop. Um, so there's a dot, so these are all the official drivers. Right? So these are drivers that are actually written by Tengen <coughs> employees, owned by Tengen, they have the copyright on, that they will officially support. There are also unofficial drivers. Um, there's anyone heard of the Google Go language? So one of my fellow Mongo masters, his name is Gustavo, and he works for Ubuntu, <coughs> lives somewhere in South America. He wrote a Go driver. He really likes Go. Um, they're the driver for Cold Fusion. Um, anyone using Cold Fusion here? Well, if you if, if if you ever have to deal with Cold Fusion, they're a Cold Fusion community driver. Um, they're the driver for any language ever. There might be a Cobol driver for a while. No, but. Uh, yeah, so whatever language you're using in your shop um, is probably here. Node is probably the new one. The .NET driver, uh, it was originally written in C Sharp for C Sharp. It works in VB.NET. Um, and somebody got it working with F Sharp. Uh, I've submitted a few patches so it works in PowerShell. Any PowerShell guys here? Okay, yeah, so uh, you can just call the driver in PowerShell. Um, and um, there also, also if, you, if you do any Iron Ruby or anything and want to try to get the driver working, submit a bug report. Um, you know, they're really big about making any of the drivers you know, work with any weird edge cases. Um, and you can see me on a bug report about the .NET driver or something like Iron Ruby because I like making weird things support weird things. Um, okay, so anyway, so, so, so you may be just saying, okay, Justin, so you talk about MongoDB, but I'm, I'm a relational DBA. Why, why, why do I care? Um, well, first of all, there is no SQL or relational DBA. Most of your job title is DBA. How many people say my job title is relational DBA? You know, maybe your job title is that you're only in charge of the Microsoft SQL instances and you don't, and there's someone else to deal with the Oracle instances. I think in most people, in most DBAs I've encountered, you know, if they're, if they're running more than one database, um, I think they're, you know, that they have to touch MySQL. You know, if, if there's MySQL in the shop, if somebody, if the CEO installs a WordPress blog in some Linux server, that you know, it's usually the DBA that has to back up that MySQL database and learn how to use PuTTY. Um, and finally, my last point is, do you want a stupid developer like me touching production? No, all right, you, you don't. Um, you know, we, we developers, and it's not that developers are, you know, not that developers, I, I've been, uh, Unix admin before I became a developer, and I just I know I never want to be 
have both jobs at the same time. It's two different mindsets. You know, the, the administrative job is very conservative in your mindset and you want to say, what can go wrong? What can break and how do I stop breach and how do I keep quality of service requirement? And the developer says, what kind of cool, you know, what kind of cool thing I can do? And you want to allow them, to, you want to allow both of them to have those mindsets and have, you know, test and, you know, QA environments so they can kind of have this graduated approach of things so, so people don't have to sit there and, and you know, so people can have the right mindset for the right job. So, not bad. Um, so what are, what are the DBA tasks in MongoDB? Okay. Um, education, first of all. Um, you know, how many people, how many DBAs here, you know, it's their job to teach the developers what a query plan is, or this is why the query runs slow, okay? Um, installing MongoDB, uh, some people might say this is a sysadmin task. Um, you know, I, I, I could agree with that. Um, authentication management, okay, most DBAs, you know, they have to deal with authentication. Uh, backups and restores, I mean, and as Paul Randall says, uh, don't have a backup plan, have a restore plan. Um, and high availability, um, something called sharding, which we'll talk about, and of course performance tuning, and performance monitoring. So backups and restores. Um, basically, how many people here have done like MySQL dump? On a, okay, so in, so in MySQL you have this command called MySQL dump, which dumps it to a, uh, uh, dumps it to basically a bunch of uh, in its create table and its service table. Um, here you have, so you have Mongo dump and Mongo restore and Mongo backup. So you, you can back it up to either um, uh, JavaScript files or you can back it up, you can back up your database to, um, to a binary format. Um, and you can either back that up, you can connect to a database and back it up, or you can stop a service and you can point to a file. So all the, the backup commands, which are separate executable, they're not like things you run in the shell. Um, actually have the full server embedded into it. So you can stop the database and just point at a folder and say just back that up to get the format. Usually what I like to do though, which, which I find just works a lot better, is I have replica sets anyway. I stop one of my services and I back up the data files. It's kind of like backing the MDF and LDF files. If your data is small enough, uh, that really works. That usually works. And um, we'll talk about sharding is, but most of the time, if you have a lot of, you want your data, if you're using MongoDB, you want your data to fit in RAM, and you're using sharding to put your data across multiple servers, uh, but you're never gonna have more than 64 gigabytes of data, because you're probably on the cloud or something, or I don't think, does anyone know a piece of, of a motherboard that can have more than 64 gigabytes of RAM physically now? I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. Which one? We have a Dell R7 example with 128 gigabytes. All right. Okay, that's the sand, but that's the sand though. It's not a. No, it's a. Oh, okay, so hundred. Okay, but even then, that's not a terrible lot. That's not a terrible lot to, to back. Up. I mean, that's, that's not like a terrible lot where you can back that up in a reasonable amount of time if you have another copy of that. If you have another part of that replica set, that's going to take you what an hour to back up on, to make a copy of it, especially if you're using volume shadow copy or whatever. So anyway, so what I would recommend, what I usually recommend, you can do Mongo dump, and some people do. Uh, honestly, what I do is I just stop the particular instances, and I, you know, if it's big enough, I'll do a, I'll do a volume shadow copy, um, and I'll just copy the data files. Now that the backup and restore don't work, you know, I mean, on SQL Server, I use the backup and restore as opposed to copying the MDF files. I just find it works for me. Um, I, maybe people who work with larger data sets than me, you know, feel otherwise, but you have both options. You basically have both options like in SQL Server. You have a traditional backup and restore, or stop the service, copy the files. Um, but with replica sets, you know that, that with replica sets and with volume shadow copy, that's something that's you know kind of feasible. Um, there's also in Mongo you can actually um, lock a database, so you can not stop your service but just lock your database on one of your replica sets, and then you can do a volume shadow copy, and you have that option. Um, so, okay, so high availability, like I said, is called replica sets. So it's built right in, you don't have to, uh, you know, they assume that the base Mongo support, if you're paying for Mongo support, that, that you're running replica sets, so it's not something, it's not like a SQL HA where, you know, we're uh, clustering in SQL Server is something you, you know, you only want if you're a big shop, you know, it's, it's expected to be built in, it's very simple to set up. Um, so there, were, there used to be what's called master-slave replication, where you said, here's my master, here's my slave, my slave was read-only, um, or I could have multiple slaves and stuff was right. Now there's something called replicas 
sense, which has been around since, uh, I believe, 1-8-ish, but it's very mature. Uh, they suggest never to use master-slave, um, and even I suggest never to use master-slave now, and I was pretty conservative about keeping master-slave in a few cases. Um, but basically, you have a bunch of uh, instances of the database, and you tell them they're all replica sets, and in their configuration file you say, here's the other parts of the replica sets. You can, if, when you introduce another one of them, it'll tell the others, hey, there's a new replica set going on, and they will, and they will have an election. They'll decide which one's the master, and they will periodically have a re-election to decide if someone else is the master. Um, and basically, you just write to all of them, and the drivers are all configured. Once you say, here are the replica set, here are at least two members, you talk to them, It'll, they'll find out the rest of the members of the replica set, um, and it'll say it'll automatically know to do a round robin read from all your your slave uh, from all the things that are slaves at the moment, and only write to the master. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, this is though where you have the problem. Anyone here with the eventual consistency problem? With atomicity. The eventual consistency. So yeah. So one of the one of the problems with this. How are we going to time by the way? Okay, we're good. Okay, so eventual consistency. So you ever see on Twitter where like, you know, you send out a Twitter and tweet and someone doesn't see it and whatever and things are out of sync. So naturally, if you're, you could be reading from, you could do a write and then read from something and, and the update could not be there because things didn't replicate across yet. So this is what's called the eventual consistency problem. Um, so you probably, you know, you might want to, you know, you might want to not necessarily use this for like, uh, you know, e-commerce data or something where you need, you know. What's the latency usually? Uh, latency should be milliseconds in most cases. I mean, okay, obviously if your replica sets are on the same, um, you know, if they're on like the Amazon Cloud in the same data center where they're, you know, on the WAN, it's gonna be milliseconds. Um, obviously, you, there's nothing stopping you from doing a replica set, you know, over, you know, to, to out of Mongolia or something, here in Mexico, um, and have a 56K modem somewhere involved somewhere, or an acoustic decoupler. I mean, so yeah, that would be more. Um, but yeah, I mean, Best case, it's usually milliseconds. Sometimes things get a little wonky. Um, so, uh, you know, that being said, you do want to be careful with with your replica sets. Um, and actually, this is one of the cases where 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 uh, master slave replication might come in because you might want to introduce a purposeful slave, uh, do a forced slave for like an offsite backup. Uh, you know. Um, okay, and then sharding. Um, so in relational data, so actually sharding is, is more of a concept of, in relational database it's the, something you have to implement in the application layer, layer. So when you're doing sharding in a relational database, you say, so here's my, let's say I'm doing a big, uh, I'm doing a big order entry. I'm doing a, I'm, I'm writing like an Amazon clone, right? I want to be the next Amazon, right? So I have gigs and gigs of merchandise, right? So obviously if everyone's hitting one relational database, that's not going to work. So I decide that, okay, so here's my, my table full of merchandise. I'm gonna split this up across 10 servers. And I'm gonna say that you know only some merchandise goes here, some merchandise goes here, some merchandise goes there, right? If I wanna do that a relational database, I have to sit there and say, well, here's my basic info, here's my tiny table I have to replicate across all these things. Here's how am I gonna set up my cardinality so so the key, so uh, the data gets written, to, you know, so data randomly gets written and evenly distributed. I have to do that at the application level. Sharding is baked into MongoDB. So all I have to do is make a collection, define it, and say, here's my sharding key, which is something with high cardinality, which just simply means the key is gonna be set up. If the, op if the opposite of your typical SQL uh, partitioning scenario, so SQL partitioning, the, the usually you do like, maybe you're doing like a order entry system and you have every 30 days you have a new file and then after, you know, after a year you rotate off the file. This you want to tend it up so instead of sitting there I'm writing everything to one thing and then I write to one file in another month and another file where I'm going to write one record here, one record there, one record there, one record there to another server. So this is baked in. You just specify your key. You say here's the collection. You have, you have to say that you know all these things are part of a sharding collection, and um, and that's all I have to do. So this is this is a cool thing that's baked in. Um, you know I don't have to sit there and do it in my application level. So, and if you want to do sharding, uh, there's a book called Scaling MongoDB by Christina Chodoro, who wrote the Perl and PHP driver, and now does core server stuff. Um, it's a 63 page book, it's all you need to know. Um, this is what Foursquare does to be completely freaking awesome um, and scale across, you know, whatever. So, 
if anyone cares about being the mayor of some restaurant. I don't have a four square account. And yeah, we don't know. Um, so other cool features. So there's BritFS, file and blob storage. So you have file table support in Mon Remember uh, last month, uh, Lenny, or the two month, was the last month Lenny talked? Oh, July. July, July. Lenny came, you talked about file table support in SQL Server, where basically you can store blobs and you can just write them to the, you kind of have this mini file system in SQL Server. MongoDB had the same thing, it has, or it has its own version called BritFS, so you can store uh, files in. And because of, remember I talked about the memory map files and it using up all your RAM, if you had it, but things got really fast. If you store images in GridFS um, and you have less images than RAM on your disk, um, you, things will be stored in RAM and it'll be faster than native disk access. So even though there's the overhead of storing stuff in the database over the file system, because stuff's always cached in memory, quick and quick and dirty image server. Okay, just just literally have GridFS and that's all you need. A few lines of ASP.NET or, or 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 whatever your language is, Ruby, PHP. Um, you know, and, and it'll work. You know, SQL Server, you could probably do the same thing, but you'd have to tune it to eat all your RAM and always cache stuff and, and what have you. Um, but this is out of the box. DB references. Uh, sometimes you might want foreign keys. Sometimes you're writing a blog, en maybe you're writing a blog engine and you want to decide that I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have one document be my, my, my document in my blog and, you know, I'm gonna keep another second document with all my comments. Maybe I just want to keep my comments separate from my main document. Um, so I'll put there in my document, I'll have a, a, a what's called a, a DB reference, which is just simply the name of the database server, the name of the database, and the name of the, um, sorry, the name of the, name of the server, name of, no, name of the database, name of the collection, name of, and the object ID of, of the, um, of the, of the uh, sub document. And I'll keep my comments in a separate place. And, you know, because maybe I don't always want to, you know, maybe it's, it's just an organizational thing. Sometimes you want to denormalize a little. It's not, I mean, Cod, if Cod were alive, he'd shoot me or turn over in his grave or something for calling it denormalization because you're actually making, instead of uh, duplicating data and, and making your individual tables bigger, you're actually um, end up with more tables, uh, more smaller collections. And then you have cap, cap collections, tail cursors, and actually time to live collection. So, uh, these are really cool features that you, there's no equivalent up in SQL Server. Uh, so what a cap collection is, is a collection that's only a certain size. And it's a certain size in terms of megabytes, and you can also secondarily say certain size in terms of uh, in number of documents. So let's say you are writing a simple thing for your NOC to view your logs. Stick it into MongoDB. You don't have to worry about cleaning up the old things. You don't have to run that little job that will um, expire things. Uh, tailable cursors is, so remember, cursors are not a bad thing, right? So if you have a cap collection, you put a tailable cursor on, and when, you're, when your cap collection runs from them, when, when, when it gets to the end of the cap collection, so you're doing a find, it'll just kind of hang there. It'll, it'll, the cursor will hang there until you write a new document. So you're writing a chat server, cap collection, tailable cursor, like there's 10 lines of Node.js, you know, you, or any language you want, and you can write a, a simple chat server with MongoDB. Um, Finally, one other new feature that came into two with a time to live collection, um, which is kind of like a cap collection, except things expire on a time. Now, obviously, the server has to manage that, but you don't have to write a separate process to expire stuff. So, if you're writing any kind of uh, queuing system where queues have a certain length, um, MongoDB with cap collection, time to live stuff, this is this is the way to go. Um, I think you know, for a lot of things where you don't need the full relational model, this is where MongoDB shines. These, these, these this, this gives you the the edge cases where you know, you can do stuff. Um, event logs. Um, one thing I do, I when I give my PowerShell and MongoDB talk, is I, I do a script where I import, you know, how many people, if you load up the event log, you know, it takes a while to load up, right, in, in Windows? Or if, even if you do get if you do get event log uh, in PowerShell and you say, give me every event log starting from a week ago, you're gonna wait 10 seconds for it to go through stuff because it's indexed one way. Um, you know, with cap collection, tap, you know, cap collections, you can sit there and, Write a job to own, to put you know your event log in for the past month. You can search a week back and it comes back instantly instead of uh, you know taking you know you know a couple of seconds and uh, you know that's a good winning case. You know and then again the chat sort of tell the persons. Uh, any questions about these features? Mind blown by it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, so support. Uh, there is no SQL help on Twitter. There's no like MongoDB help. Um, I mean, you can start a hashtag, but there, there's not uh, anyone, you know, there's not a lot of people hanging out on Twitter on a particular hashtag looking for support. That being said, if you start using Mongo a lot and make a lot of Mongo friends on Twitter, you know, people will help people out. Um, there is, uh, you know, there's documentation at mongodb.org. If you go to mongodb.org, docs.mongodb.org, a lot of documentation. There is a wiki that not, uh, it's not publicly accessible wiki, but a lot of, uh, like, all the developers have access to it, the Mongo masters have access to it. There's a lot of good information on that. Uh, they recently relaunched it and added a lot more information. Uh, Stack Overflow and Server Fault. Um, this is actually places where 10 Gen employees hang out and will answer. You will get your request in the answer by a 10 Gen employee. Um, Stack Overflow, Server Fault, and the MongoDB on Google Groups. Uh, if you ask a question, you might get it answered by someone who works for 10 Gen and you'll get it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, there are Mongo user groups. There's one in the city. Uh, so there's one in New York City, there's one in Philadelphia. I don't know if there's a Jersey one, but if someone wants to start a Jersey one, if someone have, if someone's interested, um, get in contact with Ken Jenner, get in contact with me, I'll get in contact with someone in Ken Jenner. They will sponsor meetups. They sponsor meetups all around the world, uh, literally all around the world. There's one in Munich, there's one in London. Um, and finally, like I said, you can pay for support from uh, Ken Jenner. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of, it, it's a big community, I think, you know, it's, it, 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 I don't know if it's as big as the SQL community, but it's definitely, uh, you, you, get an answer, you, you get your question answered. Um, there's definitely people to help you. There's IRC channels, there's all sorts of stuff. So, uh, what's the most popular NoSQL database? What I, uh, I, I haven't seen any metrics. Um, I would say it's one of the more popular ones. Um, I would say uh, I mostly talk to Windows groups because I'm, I'm a Windows guy. Um, the competitors, I would say, uh, CouchDB was like the original competitor, um, but I haven't heard when, no one ever asks about CouchDB when I do a, a, a Mongo talk anymore. Uh, usually, uh, Ryak is a little popular, but, and also uh, RavenDB, which is written in .NET. So usually, RavenDB is usually, if I, if I go to like an old .NET group, Raven these days is what people saying, well, what about Raven? Mm -hmm. um, that, that's kind of the cool kit, but I think this is, Mongo's kind of becoming a, you know, I mean, it's only a couple years old. It's kind of becoming a mature thing. I, I would say it's, you know, one of the, it's, it's what I use, um, you know, in terms of document databases. Obviously, there are other forms of NoSQL, like, you know, there's Hadoop, there are GraphDBs, which serve a different niche, uh, niche. but I guess Couch, Ryak, and uh, Mongo, Raven are kind of like the, the document, you know, this, this type, this flavor of NoSQL.